Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste friends, welcome back to this fifth lecture on the course on psychology of language. Now the highlight of today's lecture which is the fifth lecture and the one to follow this one which is the sixth lecture would be on speech production which is how do we produce speech, the talking that we do, how do we do that. What we will uh, unfold in this lecture is the very basic. So, uh, please understand that this is not a linguistic course and so we will not go into too much detail onto the linguistic aspect of speech production. So, we will just look at the psychological aspects of lingu uh, language production or production of speech and so we will be quite restrained in uh, our explanation. But before we start unfolding the lecture as uh, I have been doing in the past lectures, let us uh, look at a little bit from the past lectures that is 1, 2, 3, 4 lecture number and that also helps you uh, in getting the context of these lectures, so each lecture getting into the context. So, the psychology of language as I said is a course which looks at the psychological aspects of language. So, obviously in the first two lectures, we tried to define what is language. We started off by explaining the basic form of language which is animal communication system and we looked at what are the characteristics of this animal communication system. Since animals communication is the very primitive language or the very basic language. Now, as we said there, it is a very basic system which can only explain, uh, express a few ideas. So, we looked at that, we looked at why do animals communicate and we looked at some characteristics of this language system. Then we moved on to the idea of human language. We saw how human language is different from animal language. So, basically the characteristic features of human language namely that it can produce a multitude of ideas and it can have a structure which is recursive in nature which provides it with the flexibility of expressing within few limited uh, basic structures the whole language itself. So, we started looking at human language and we started distinguishing between human language and uh, the animal language. We then looked at the characteristics of human language. We looked at things like uh, the various modes of human language and the idea of duality of patterning. We looked at how the human language is built right from the basic speech sound to the idea of morphemes to the idea of word, sentences, syntax which is how the words should be arranged, grammar which is the rules that a language should follow, then the idea of discourse. So, we looked at all those structures of how the human language is um, Arranged. We also looked at certain rules of the phase structure rules and how uh, within a particular sentences certain parts of uh, uh, the language or the certain, certain words can be rearranged. Then we focused on the fact of how language evolved. So, we saw how the 
Neanderthal mans, the Homo sapiens, they came across and how they had uh, developed this idea of language. And we looked at the continuity and the discontinuity theory of language, which basically says how language evolved. And after that, we moved on to, and so we looked at several evidences of both the continuity and the discontinuity theory. And then we looked at the fact of how uh, uh, the fossils of language, the so living fossils of language, basically how um, languages were described to have evolved from uh, the proto language. The idea that uh, the present human language, which is complex in nature, how it evolved from a proto language or basic language. So, uh, there we investigated the idea of pidgins, which are a uh, primary form of language which do not have too many uh, words into it, too many complexities into it, but can be expressed for expressing ideas. And we looked at how this language teaching research has been done across um, various uh, scientists and how some basic language, human language were taught to uh, chimpanzees and how uh, chimpanzees and human were difficult. So, the idea of um, Chomsky which says that humans have a language acquisition device against the idea that uh, animals do not have that kind of a thing. So, uh, we concluded the chapter there with this debate. Lecture number 3 and 4 was explicitly focusing on research methodology into language. So, we explained what is the way of doing research in language. I explained in detail what is the scientific method, what is theory, what is hypothesis, how theory, hypothesis, observation and patterns they interact together uh, to form the research cycle and the idea of how induction and deduction works into the research cycle and how we build models to explain certain uh, hypothesis uh, or, or uh, certain predictions of the theory. We looked at the idea of experimental design, how there are uh, the between subject and within subject designs and what are the IVs and DVs and those kind of things that we looked at. We looked at uh, behavioral techniques of uh, doing language research in which we primarily looked at latency which is uh, the reaction time and accuracy which is the correctness as dependent variable measure measurement or as choices of measurement variables in most language researches. We uh, looked at several examples uh, in terms of the uh, lexical decision uh, task and several other examples uh, there to explain in detail what we have been um, uh, covering or what we have been talking about. And lastly, we looked at the language and the brain, how the brain and the language are integrated together. We focused on certain regions of the brain. Uh, certain areas which are dedicated to language and we looked at certain uh, equipments uh, techniques like EEG, MRI, fMRI and how these uh, techniques are used for studying language or for completing a research on language. Now, today's lecture would be an interesting lecture where we look at how do humans produce speech. The way I am speaking to you how do I produce this speech? So, uh, to start today's story, we will go back to uh, the Haskins laboratory where the first artificial speaking machines were designed and these are called the pattern playback machine. Now, these pattern uh, interest in language of how language is produced is uh, has been around for quite some time. And just after the World War I, Haskins laboratory uh, produced an artificial uh, language machine which was called the pattern playback machine. Now, of course, this machine had no vocal cord, no mouth uh, and other uh, language equipments which human have to produce speech. But what this machine was able to do was produce some basic frequency sounds and these basic frequency sounds when they were put together in a sequence, it sounded like the human language or the human speech. That was the beauty of it. So, uh, but it could produce only very basic speech. So, even the sounds which are produced by this machine, uh, 
when they were arranged in complex pattern it could not be matched exactly to uh, the way humans produce the phones the basic speech sound but it was much closer so humans when uh, the playback machine were played back to the artificial machine was played back to human they could hear or they could promise that they hear some basic speech sounds that was the first attempt from then which was just after the world war 1 uh, world war 2 to presently we have much dedicated systems which produce artificial language we have siri we have the google assistant which can not only understand but also listen to you and then respond to you so the first machines which were producing just specific frequencies which uttered when uttered through this uh, complex arrangement of uh, sounds sounded like human language to the present world google assistant which you can talk to and not only it produces sound which you can hear and understand it can also understand what you are saying and comprehend meaning out of your speech so vast area so let's look at some of the psychology behind uh, the speech perception we'll start by looking at how language is what is the very basic uh, item or element in producing of speech and so the very basic element in auditory perception is the speech sound the look of speech so how does sound look like now as you know what is sound the ear actually when you produce speech there is a pressure difference which is created and this pressure difference it moves in terms of waves across the space between two people one the producer of the speech and the other the receiver of the speech and when it hits the ear which is the perceiving mechanism for the other person this is decoded back this this pressure or this wave which is traveling and meaning is extracted out of it or people understand that the producing system is the vocal cord or the vocal fold and the mouth and the receiving system is the ear so we we'll look at these two systems but even before we do that what is used to transfer this uh, vocal fold vibrations is the wave the sound wave if you ever uh, so how do you explain this wave if you ever sat near a pool of water taken a rock and thrown it into the water you will see patterns of uh, high pressure area and low pressure area or uh, certain patterns moving away from the point of impact of the uh, stone and this is what a wave is all about and this is how the sound wave also looks like so any wave a wave is basically uh, the highs and lows of pressure so when we when we speak what we are actually doing is that there are air molecules between uh, our uh, mouth and the, uh, the other person's ear and so these are air molecules are uh, are are vibrating in a particular frequency and so when we speak what happens is the vibration changes in a certain way and so it travels in the form of a wave now any wave the so, so basically sound is a wave so any wave has two fundamental things or there are two fundamental properties of any wave the first is called the frequency the frequency of the wave and so what is the frequency it is the number of wavelengths that pass by a given point in a given amount of time so if this is my measurement axis or this is where i am doing the detection and let's say this is my time axis so let's say from 0 to 1 second the number of times this is 0 second and this is 1 second the number of times this vibration is there is called the frequency so number of wavelengths this is one wavelength this is two wavelength this is three wavelength four wavelength and so on and so forth so the number which is there that gives the amount and this is measured in cycles per second or hertz how many cycles so this is one cycle this is two cycle this is a sine wave right a sine wave starts at the 00 epoch 
goes to a maxima, a local maxima, comes back to the baseline, goes back to a negative max, uh, a minima and then comes back to this is what a sine wave looks like. I am pretty sure you must know what a sine wave is and so most uh, sound waves are sine are considered to be sine waves. So, basically a wave is explained then in terms of how many waves or how many uh, wavelengths pass a given point this is my point axis detection time and in one second how many of them are pa passing let us say there are 15 so it is 15 cycle per second or 15 hertz. The psychological perception of sound wave frequency is called a pitch. So, what we call frequency in the physical domain is called a pitch on the psychological domain. So, when we talk about pitch it is how many wavelengths are passing a particular point of time a particular point of detection in a particular period of time. So, this is the first thing you should know about a wave and I am pretty sure you know these things. So, we are just repeating these things or we are just adding on to it. The next thing that you should know about a wave is the amplitude. This is the height of a wave from the baseline the deviation from the baseline. So, amplitude is the amount of change that a wave undergoes during one cycle. So, wave starts here goes to a maxima goes to a minima and comes back to the baseline. So, the maximum change that it is facing this point to this point is called the amplitude. This is also in terms of sound wave the difference between the highest pressure and the lowest pressure or the sound wave is called the amplitude of that wave. So, the amount of change that wave undergoes in one cycle is the amplitude. These two things are very necessary the frequency and amplitude and most measurements of wave are done on this basis only. So, on the physical domain this is called the amplitude in the psychological domain this is called the loudness. <coughs> so, what you call amplitude in physical domain <coughs> is loudness in the psychological domain. Now, these two properties the amplitude and the frequency it describes the sine wave so called a sine wave is so called because it is a wave that can be described by a trigonometric function which is called the sine function. So, sine waves why do we call a sine wave a sine wave because it is basically can be explained through the trigonometric function of sine. Now, some other things that we need to know we need to know what is the fundamental frequency of any wave. If you take a rubber band and put it across your two fingers and pluck it bring it near your ears it will produce a sound you will see the rubber band vibrating. The vibrations which happen across the entire length of the rubber band is called the fundamental frequency. So, vibrations along the entire length of the string or rubber band generates the fundamental frequency and which is also the lowest frequency produced by the vibrating object. Now, since it is for the entire length obviously, the amplitude has to be less. So, this is the low frequency since across the thing. So, the frequency will generally be 1 and so the low frequency produced by vibrating object is called the fundamental frequency. But when you look at a vibrating object this object does not only produce waves across the entire length right vibrations also happen at half the length and then one fourth the length. So, when you have a vibrating object or a tuning fork this is my fundamental frequency this is another frequency and this is another frequency. So, this is the full length L 0 this is L 1 and this is L 2. So, L 2 is one fourth of L 0 L 1 is half of L 0 and L 0 is of course, L 0. Now, this type of frequencies vibrations at half length, third length and so on generate what are called the overtones. So, if you have a guitar and a violin they sound different because although the fundamental frequency. So, if you if they are playing the same um, string say uh, A minor or something like that although they are playing the same sound 
they sound differently because they have different overtones, the length are different and so they produce different overtones. So, higher frequencies are also produced by the vibrating object and these are produced as timber. Frequencies higher than the fundamental frequency is called the overtones because they are at half length and one fourth of length and these in the psychological domain is known as timber. So, overtones are called timber. Now, if you remember these are the three things that we have in sound, we have the pitch which is the frequency, we have the loudness which is the amplitude and then we also have the overtones which is partial frequencies, half frequencies, half than the or frequencies higher than the fundamental frequency and these are called the timber. Waveform A and B have the same frequency but different amplitudes as do waveform C and D. Look at A, B, C, D. Waveform A and C have the same amplitude but different frequencies as do wavelength B and D, B and D. Waveform E is a periodic noise while waveform F is one cycle of a periodic musical keynote played on a clarinet. So, this is periodic this is a periodic and so we will we'll discuss that a periodic periodic. So, this is my from this tone to this tone is my frequency and this is my amplitude. So, a vibrating object produces a sound with a regularly repeating pattern. So, when uh, something is vibrating an object like a tuning fork is vibrating it produces sound with repeated regular repetition. This is known as a periodic sound. Two objects but that is not the only sound which is there. So, most vibrating objects they produce periodic sound, but some of them also produce sometimes they also produce aperiodic sounds. So, two objects rub against each other produce a sound with no regular repetition pattern and these are called the aperiodic noise. For example, you rub your hand like this and bring it near your ears, the sound that you hear is not periodic and this is called aperiodic noise, aperiodic tone. So, periodic sound these are regularly repeating pattern produced by vibrating objects perceived as ringing or musical in nature and vowels are periodic speech sounds. So, this, this two we have not explained, but this two we have explained and so most vowels are periodic and most consonants are aperiodic. So, A, E, I, O, U you can sing this this are produced by the vibrating cord without any restriction to the air which is sent out by the mouth. So, A, E, I no restriction and so you can sing it, but with other things the consonants. So, anything except the A, I, A, E, I, O, U in English language is a consonant. So, for example, B, B as there is a restriction in the sound which is coming out of the mouth and this is called a consonant. So, a periodic sound these are generally produced by consonants, no regular repetition pattern produced by collusion or friction perceived as noise and consonants are a periodic speech sounds. Speech sounds can be broadly categorized into vowels and consonants. Vowels are periodic which is they are ringing their musical char uh, character to them. For example, A I can keep, keep on singing like that, but then consonants are a periodic and they are noisy. I cannot say T go on saying T and not lose my breath, I can uh, after a period of time I will lose my breath. There are however, some consonants which can be produced without friction. For example, the SH sh, you can do that the SH noise produced with without friction this is also a consonant and you can do it for a longer breath across your breath. But then there are other consonants like P you cannot sing it for a longer period of time. So, these are the basics of the sound or the basic of the wave from which the speech is produced, how the speech is produced. Next we look into how this speech which is produced by the vocal tract, how this is heard by the ear. So, if I ask you this question how do you hear sound? The answer to this is through my ear and maybe you will point to this, this, this cartilage which is coming out from the head. 
Now, obviously, this is this has nothing to do. This is this is a directional mechanism, and this part, if even if I cut out, like Van Gogh did, you will still be able to hear sounds. So, this has nothing to do with the ear. The ear perception of sound in the ear actually starts in the inner ear, at the inside of a ear. So, basically, the organ of auditory sensation is the cochlea. That's the a uh, snail like organ inside the ear in the inner ear which has hair like structure which can see or which can perceive changes in sound and then convert these changes into electrical impulses which are then perceived by the prom, uh, primary auditory cortex. The basilar membrane extends inside the length of the cochlea and its hair cells are sensitive to particular frequencies. So, the cochlea is a, uh, the cochlea has a basilar membrane, it is a two part system and so the basilar membrane is lined by hairs, it is filled with fluid, the sound that we are producing, the wave pressure, the, the, the waves that we are producing at different frequencies, they are perceived by the cochlear hairs and they are transposed or they are changed into electrical signals which are perceived by the or picked up by the primary auditory cortex through a mechanism. So, cochlea it is an or organ of auditory sensation in the inner ear, basilar membrane extends inside the cochlea undulated vibrations fluid of the <coughs> cochlea. As I said the cochlea has hairs, the basilar membrane of the cochlea has hairs and it is filled with fluid and in this fluid the sound waves travel and they are picked up by the hair cells of the basilar membrane. Now, the basilar membrane which you have in the inner ear which actually picks up sound has something called a tonotropic organization. Now, what is tonotropic organization? It means that if you have ever seen a piano, you have high sounds to low sounds. If you play it this way, different frequencies are arranged. So, higher frequencies to or lower frequencies to higher frequency. So, basically what tonotropic organization means that it has sensitivity to different frequencies at one end and lower frequencies at the other end. So, you have the hair cells are arranged in such way that such a way that higher frequencies are perceived at one end and lower frequencies are perceived at the other end. So, that is how the hairs are arranged. The primary auditory cortex is located in the superior temporal lobe and it has the same tonotropic organization as the basilar membrane. So, the primary auditory cortex which picks up the signal from the cochlea, it is arranged in the same way that the basilar membrane inside the cochlea is, which is tonotropic organization. So, high frequencies and if you ever seen a piano, you have things like this, right? These are the keys of a piano and if you keep on pressing, you will see the frequencies from high, from low to high, it will keep on going. So, what is tonotropic organization? It is a progressive arrangement of cells sensitivity to different frequencies. The primary auditory cortex, this is the region which gets input from the hair cells of the basilar membrane inside the cochlea. So, superior temporal lobe, initial processing of input from the cochlea arranged in tonotropical like the basilar membrane. This is how the ear is. So, when you actually hear something comes here, this is my so, even if you cut this pinna and next external auditory canal, nothing happens here. The perception starts or the actual hearing starts here. This is my eardrum. Now, this is a membrane on which the waves will come and bounce. And this is attached to a three part system, which is called the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup. And so, these wheels, this is the part of the inner ear. And what they do is they mechanically they enhance the wave. And then from here it moves to the inner ear, which is the this is where the cochlea is. Inside this you will have the basilar membrane. Now, in the basilar membrane, there are hair like structures which are arranged and then it is filled with the sound waves. They move into this cochlea 
or move through the liquid of the cochlea and these are perceived or these are picked up by the hair cells which are here. These are arranged from 20 hertz to different hertz right and so different frequencies are there right from 20 hertz this is the beginning to 20,000 hertz which is the limit and can be picked in that way. Hair cells along the base are organized according to the frequency they are sensitive to with the highest frequency position at the opening of the cochlea as you can see this is 1000 hertz, 20,000 hertz, 1000 hertz uh, sorry 10,000 hertz, 5000 hertz, 4000 hertz, 3000, 2000, 6000, 8000, 6000, 800, 600, 400 and so on and so forth. And these are hair cells which are there inside this. This is filled with fluid moves here if it is a 20,000 hertz pitch that you are uh, that you are producing it will be picked up from here <coughs> reported to the primary auditory cortex which actually takes this signal and converts into electrical signal because inside the brain everything is electrical in nature so, sound waves are converted into electrical signals inside the ear now the auditory cortex is tucked between inside the lateral fissure of the surface that is still considered to be part of the temporal lobe. The primary auditory cortex is arranged in tonotropical fashion just like the basilar membrane. This is my secondary auditory cortex, this is my primary auditory cortex, it is arranged in the same way in which the basilar membrane is and so as you can see 16,000 hertz, 8,000 hertz, 4,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz, 1,000 hertz, 500 hertz and so on and so forth and so the basilar membrane hair cells connect to this different different so this is the 5000 500 hertz basilar membrane hair cells gives a signal here electrical signal from here it passes primary auditory cortex passes to the secondary auditory cortex and secondary auditory cortex then makes a perception of it basic idea is that they are in the same way like a piano so the primary auditory cortex is located in the superior temporal lobe temporal lobe and it has the same tonotopic arrangement as the basilar membrane. Neighboring cortical regions including the Wernicke area in the left hemisphere do higher level processing of the auditory input. So, the Wernicke area then takes in from the secondary uh, processing area and it does higher level processing of the sound. Now, we cannot recognize objects and events just by the way they sound. The idea is that sound is enough for us to recognize objects and so we can recognize objects just by the sound of it. For example, falling glass the whistling of the tree. We can just recognize objects or object movements through sound. Speech sounds are likewise auditory events that are extremely short duration, yet our ability to perceive them accurately is remarkable. Speech sounds although most speech sounds are time based. So, basically speech sounds or auditory perception is a time based event. It moves across time, it is a single channel event. And so, what happens is that they are very short duration but we can perceive them. Think of the of last office meeting you have, there is so much sound everywhere it was all, uh, all around there was so much sound. But you can very easily in that uh, in, 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 in that humdrum of so much sounds, you can still perceive different speech sounds from different objects and, and can uh, locate or can uh, think about what object is making that sound. That is the beauty of the speech system. So, auditory perception unfolds along a time dimension. It happens across a time when the time goes away or it moves in a time dimension. So, you have to perceive it across time, not across space as in visual perception happens across space, but auditory perception generally happens across time. So, then having said that, having looked at the wave which is the primary source of auditory perception and the apparatus that makes sound or that perceives sound, let us look at the speech stream in itself. When we speak what really happens? Now, written text, what does the speech stream consist of? So, if, if you look at written text, let us look at this text, sound results from vibrations, let us look at this text. Now, if you look at it, there are certain words which are close together and there are certain spaces which are there and so we can distinguish between words. So, written text they have discrete letters with each word separating through spaces from immediate neighbors. You can 
know of that. Speech stream, they do not have discrete phonemes and clear word boundaries. Speech is a continuous, so when you speak there is no space between it, there is no clear boundaries. Speech is continuous in nature and so speech is a continuous flow of ever changing frequencies and amplitudes. When we speak, we speak on and so there is always changing frequencies and amplitudes which are moving, there is no gap between that. Speech perception system, they infer intended phonemes and word boundaries. So, it is the beauty of the speech perception system which generates boundaries of where there, there should be gap in the spoken speech. If you ever look at a spectrogram which is a machine which converts the spoken speech into its fundamental frequencies, you will see certain regions which are not populated when in, 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 in uh, speech, in speech output. These regions which are not populated are actually not periods of silence. There are certain consonants which are called the stop consonants and is basically the stop consonant which is putting that white space in the spectrogram. So, the spectrogram, so uh, the spectrogram allows us to visualize the structure of speech stream. Spectrogram is a machine which takes in the speech stream or the sound which is coming out of your mouth and it projects it and we can uh, study the speech stream to that. Now, what is the spectrogram? The spectrogram of speech sample consists of alterations of aperiodic and periodic sounds roughly corresponding to consonants all over the language. So, when we look at a spectrogram, it actually consists of aperiodic and periodic sounds, which basically is that it is consisting of consonants and vowels, how they are produced by the speech stream and that is what is the display actually showing. And as I said, the periods of silence are actually consonants which are called the stop consonants certain consonants in English language which are called the subconsonants. Now, at the bottom of any spectrogram, the fundamental frequency of the speech is displayed. This is the fundamental frequency or the sound resulting from the vibration of the vocal uh, fold as air is expelled from lung and which is called the phonation. So, what is phonation? Phonation is the fundamental frequency of the sound which is resulting from the vibration of the vocal fold as air is expelled from the lungs sound resulting from vibration of the vocal fold air air is expelled from the lung is called is what is called phonation. So, the primary frequency that we have the fold the primary uh, vibration that the vocal tract is doing is called the phonation and then a related term is called the prosody what is prosody. Now, this fundamental frequency the rate of vibration of the vo vocal fold results from fluctuation in the fundamental frequency during an utterance. Now, this fundamental frequency is never constant, the fundamental frequency is the vocal fold vibration and is different for different people. Now, these fundamental frequency is also not constant, it, it varies across time and so or, or across a utterance, across a speech and these vibrations in pitch in frequency is called the prosody. So, what is prosody? the way you speak, when you speak there will be variations in the vibrations of the vocal tract, the frequency of vibration of the vocal tract. Of course, everybody has a uh, fundamental frequency, but this fundamental frequency keeps on changing and that is what is prosody. So, what is prosody? These are fluctuations in fundamental frequency during an utterance, conveys both linguistic and emotional information and that is what a prosody is. And why is prosody uh, important? Because it conveys linguistic and uh, in both emotional information that is why it is Im important. So, prosody serves a number of linguistic functions as well as conveying information about the speaker's emotional state. How are you if I say that? How are you if I say that? Oh, how are you if I say that? And so, the same way the way we speak this how are you that is basically prosody, the change that I am doing to the fundamental frequency. Everybody has a fundamental frequency, but the change in the fundamental frequency which I am doing or the change in the pitch that is what is called the prosody. The prosody stretch, uh, stretches or the speech stream reveals bands of high amplitude sound at certain frequency above fundamental frequency. So, if you look at this prosodic stretch or speech stream, the change in the fundamental frequency in an utterance, if you look at that, it reveals bands of high amplitude sound at certain frequencies and above the fundamental frequency. So, there will be some part 
this this prosody will be high at some part above the fundamental frequency and low at some part. These ba bands are called formants and result from the fact that the shape of the vocal tract dampens certain harmonics and enhances others. So, formants are what? These are the bands of high amplitude sound at certain frequencies above the fundamental frequency. When you produce sound, it is not always fundamental frequency. Sometimes it is high above the fundamental frequency, sometimes it is low the, below the fundamental frequency. The bands of high amplitude sound <coughs> at certain frequencies above the fundamental frequency are called the formants. And why do they come? They happen because these formants happen because the vocal tract, the one which is producing the sound, they dampen certain harmonics and they enhances other harmonics and that is why you get a formant. They occur during periodic stretches of speech stream which is basically the vowel. So, periodic stretches is uh, yeah, so not the vowel basically. Now, so these are the formants. So, there is this change that you are seeing up in an utterance above the fundamental frequency and below the fundamental frequency are basically formant. The relative distance between the first and the second formant in comparison to the fundamental frequency is used to distinguish vowels. So, how do we distinguish vowels? The change that we see between two alternate formants and by comparing this to the fundamental frequency is how we distinguish different vowels. Now, periodic stretch in the speech stream may also uh, signal something called a sorrent, a sonorant. Now, this periodic stretch may also signal something called a sonorant. So, what is this? This is a speech sound that usually serves as a consonant, but sometimes as a vowel. So, what is a sonorant? sonorant uh, uh, a sonorant is basically just like it is, uh, we use a formant to distinguish a vowel, we use a sonorant to distinguish a consonant. And so, what are sonorant? These are speech sounds that are usually served as a consonant, but sometimes they also act like vowels. For example, the L, the R, the N and M in English language. Example, the first L, if I, if I write little, the first L acts as a consonant, whereas the second L acts as a vowel because E is silent here. So, I said little, little. I do not pronounce this E and so this second L acts as a vowel or seems like a vowel and that is why it is it is uh, that is how it looks like. Now, a periodic portion of the speech stream clearly indicates a consonant. So, periodic is vowel or periodic is consonant. The first type there are two types of the first type of a periodic stretch a periodic portion in the speech stream which is displayed by a uh, spectrogram is the fricative, two types of periodic stretches. The first type is the called the fricative. What is it? It is a consonant that is produced by constricting the air stream to create friction. Fric fricative is basically a consonant which is produced by blocking the, uh, the stream of air which is coming from the vocal cord, so that a friction happens. Try saying S, S, H and F. So, S the way you do it, the hissing sound that is produced here is basically the fricative and this is the consonant that I am producing, one type of consonant. The second type of consonant that is produced or that can be seen in the speech stream in our periodic speech stream is called the plosive. And what is the plosive? It is a consonant that is produced by momentarily blocking and then releasing the air stream. So, in fricative we constrict the air stream to create a friction and out of that the vowel comes in. The second type is we momentarily block the air stream which is coming from the vocal cord and then release the air stream and the vowel produced out of that is basically the plosives. For example, the P, the D, the T, these are also called the stop. So, basically then there is also something called the formant transitions and these are the modifications of the formant due to preceding or following consonant. These are 
uh, uh, transition in the foramen. Now, major categories of uh, speech sounds, sound waves, speech sound, characteristics and examples. For example, periodic, vowels, distinguished by the first two formats, I, O, U, I, O, U. Similarly, the sonorant, as I said, some of the, some of the sonorant can act like a vowel. For example, sometimes vowels uh, act as consonants and these are sometimes vowels and sometimes consonants. For example, little, river, a periodic if it is, then I have the fricatives which are constricted as to producing fiction, Susie has a fever and similarly if it is plosives then constricting as to and then releasing it, as to momentary block then released for example, pay k today basic speech sounds. The high energy segments are vowels and the silent segments are consonants. This is my vowels, this is my consonant which are only identified by the effects that they have a proceeding for vowel and consonant and this is the pronunciation or the spectrogram for the word attitude. The way I say is this is my vowel, I vowel as you see, U consonant this reason. Okay. There are other interesting thing uh, in, in uh, the speech sound that is uh, something about the voice onset time, but we will not uh, take that now we will move on to uh, how uh, co-articulation and aspiration really works. What is co-articulation? Overlapping phonemes in the speech stream produces co-articulation. Preceding or following a consonant modifies a vowel to a formant. So, a consonant modifies a vowel formant by preceding or succeeding it. So, although they are not more than the brief bits of silence, plosives are common in English language and in languages around the world. So, most English languages and languages around the world have something called plosives. And uh, then what is aspiration? It is a puff of air which is accompanying some plosives distinguishing B from P and T from C. So, let us look at what is uh, aspiration then. Let us consider consonant pairs like B and P. Aspiration is the sound of air which is or the puff of air which is coming out from the vocal tract. So, how do we distinguish B and P from each other, the consonant B and P and that is based on the, uh, the uh, uh, aspiration. So, vowels are easy, but consonants are little bit difficult. Now, imagine this, put your left hand on the throat and the right hand in front of your mouth and try saying ba and pa do that. If you do that, you will notice two things. There is more phonation or vocal cord vibration in ba than pa. So, in terms of the left hand, it when you say ba and pa, in ba there is more phonation, there is more vibration in the vocal cord, but in pa it is not. And so, how do you distinguish between b and p, that kind of a plosive. Also, if you look at the right hand, there is a greater puff of air with ba than pa. So, more puff of air and more vibration on the vocal uh, tract. Now, the puff of air accompanying the release of some plosive is called aspiration. For example, if you look at uh, word pairs like da and ta and ba and pa, both of them are accompanied by a puff of air when they are produced and this air production when producing certain plosives which are certain type of consonants are called aspiration. The two characteristics of phonation and aspirations are generally explained in terms of something called the voice onset time. And what is voice onset time? The voice onset time, so how are we measure, measuring this between P and B perception? It is in terms of the word voice onset time and what is the voice onset time? The voice onset time is the difference in time between the release of a plosive consonant and the beginning of a vocal fold vibration or the, the release of the consonant, the plosive consonant and the vibration of the vocal cord, the difference between that it what is called the voice onset time. It is the difference between the release of a plosive, a consonant and the beginning of a vocal fold vibration, the vowel. 
now speech sounds they do not occupy discrete sections of speech stream but rather they overlap each other in a process which is known as co-articulation. So, what happens or what is co-articulation is that when we speak the speech that we are producing is basically overlapped over one another and that is what is called co-articulation. Speech sounds are perceived categorically even though they are produced differently depending in the context. So, when we perceive speech we do not look at the specific sections of the speech the specific plosives and or fricatives or uh, vowels we look look at speech as a whole and we perceive them in certain categories that is what is called categorical perception. So, speech sounds are perceived categorically even though they are produced differently depending on the context. So, we categorize certain speech sounds and then we perceive them together. Originally categorical perception was believed to be a unique characteristic of speech perception. Now, it was soon understood that as a general it, as a general so categorical per, uh, perception is a general cognitive principle. Simply put categorical perception is one way our brains deal with the massives of the real world. If you look at the real world there is so much sound which is there is so much things which are there where people are talking things are falling so many sounds are there. So, the best way for speech perception is by putting category. So, this is human speech this is uh, what the brain does is it separates from a different number of frequencies around you it does what it does is it separates certain speeches and it says that this is human speech this is object speech this is the sp speech of an animal this is a speech of something and that is how it perceives. So, it puts, puts them into certain characteristics and that is how it uh, basically goes through the everyday messiness. The speech perception system relies on context to fill the missing information. So, what is categorical perception? Continuously changing stimuli perceived as belonging to discrete sets. We take a uh, number of uh, stimuli and perceive them together. So, speech perception system they rely on context to fill in missing information from a speech stream that has been marked by ambient noise in the process is known as what for uh, phonemic restoration. When we speak just to prove that this categorical perception happens if we are speaking and certain segments of the speech are missing the speech perception system is able to manufacture or fill this thing and this is what is called the phonemic restoration. So, filling in missing segments of speech stream with contextually appropriate material is what is called phonemic restoration. So, if I have a context if I have certain words missing certain letters or certain parts of letters missing from a, a, a speech stream from a, a sentence I can restore that and that is what is called phonemic restoration. For example, Warren and Warren they tested this phonemic restoration effect what they did was they produced sentences like this the state government met with their respective legislature and they put a star here in the s which is missing conveying in the capital city this is a sentence they read to people. This is the sentence that they read to people and in this particular word this missing s was either replaced by a cuff or by a silence. When a silence is produced legislators this way people are not able to restore the s, but when people cuff in between for example, <laughs> Letters, legis, letters. In this case, people are able to restore the S. So, participants heard gap, noticed who heard gap, they noticed the missing S, but participants heard missing S play, uh, place cuff before or after legislature. So, if you cover it with a cuff, then people restore this S, and this is what is called the phonemic restoration. People are able to create the phone back, restore the phone back. So, Warren Warren 1970 they modified the following sentence by splicing out the wh from this word. So, it was found that uh, the wh from this was splicing out the wh from the wheel and it was found at the star e e l here people were able to replace that. Now, it was also found out that if I change this thing here the last word the context will decide will design how what people are. Uh, uh, filling in. So, what letters what phoneme is being filled here is dependent on the context to prove that what Warren and Warren did was they took a sentence like this it was found out that the 
star e e l was was on the and when they filled up this last word with x l people heard it was wheel. But when the last word was shoe people heard that or people re, uh, reported that they heard heel. So, in x l they represented wheel, but in word in shoe they represented heel and that is the restoration that was happening. So, it was context dependent the restoration was context dependent. So, re, this was replaced by a calf also x l was replaced by shoe similarly shoe if uh, shoe was and, and if I replace the shoe with an orange in here people would say found that the peel. So, p here w uh, h here and w h here people were able to replace these phonemes. Now, psycholinguists used to assume that the senses operated independent of each other. It was believed by psycholinguists that auditory perception happens on its own, visual perception ha or happens on its own and so there is no link between that. But it was soon, soon found out that there is a relation between auditory perception and visual perception and perceptions of uh, auditory nature are multimodal in nature. In recent year researchers agree that uh, to the idea that the senses strongly interact with each other to produce a rich experience of the word and this is called the uh, multimodal perception. So, multimodal perception says that senses strongly interact produce rich experience. So, when we are producing uh, auditory perception the visual information is also included in it in the in the auditory perception and they integrate together to give up the whole idea of uh, the sentence meaning that is being generated. And to test this McGrook what they did was they produce a illusion and in this illusion they made people hear a particular uh, word they made people see somebody speaking a particular word, but there was no voice. So, in one case people spoke and so you can auditorily hear what the person is speaking. In the other case you can see lip the read the lip of the person which is producing he is producing a particular uh, uh, a letter or a word and what they did was they made sure that people hear D and people see G being produced. So, the speaker uh, in, in, in the visual form is producing G in the auditory form the audio that uh, somebody is hearing is he is hearing B when he is seeing somebody speaking it uh, what uh, the, uh, the, the experimenter or, or the volunteer is uh, seeing G and when it was a later asked what do you see or what letter was being produced it was found out that it was in, mid, in uh, between B and G what people perceived or experimenters perceive was D. So, somebody who saw somebody producing uh, so somebody who heard somebody producing B or volunteers when they heard, uh, heard somebody producing B in auditory domain and saw him or read his lip and when this when they read his lip the produce the person who was acting was producing G what later on they revealed what this produce two people were producing was D which was in between B and G. So, speech perception combines both auditory and visual information this is the first effect or the first time it was found out that speech perception happens from both the streams it happens from the visual stream as well as the auditory stream. So, the McGrook effect is a artificially induced illusion in which the auditory information from one speech sound is combined with the visual information from another speech sound to produce the perception of a third speech sound as you said they hear they see somebody speak uh, uh, speaking B and they see somebody producing G when later on when they were asked what is being produced they they report see hearing D or seeing D in between. So, that brings us to the end of this session of lecture number 5 where we looked at how speech is produced for the uh, first time. So, what are the characteristics of speech? So, we looked at the characteristics of a wave and we also looked at the organization of the human ear which does perception of speech. Then we moved on to looking at how this speech perception is represented in terms of the spectrogram we looked at how a periodic and periodic sounds which is vowels and consonants are represented and how these vowels and consonants are perceived and then mean and then it is perceived back by the speech systems. We also looked at uh, speech perception in the multimodal form 
and uh, what are fl uh, plosives and fricatives and other kind of interesting things. Uh, how the speech is translated into thought and then how this uh, the speech stream is actually um, is, is actually perceived or it how, how it progresses and then we looked at how the phoneming re, the phoneme restoration effect which is a certain words or certain letters are not spoken in a speech stream how they are covered up by the brain so that's that's what we did in uh, today's lecture when we continue on with this lecture in the next uh, 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 next session what we'll do is we'll look at how this system uh, actually evolved and we look at especially children and, and try and see how this system of speech perception or uh, reach speech production rather they evolved and so several other interesting facts related to the production of speech. So, till we do that when we meet next and till that point of time it is goodbye and namaste from the studios. Thank you.